Buongiorno. Allora, è mio piacere presentarvi il professor uh, Distinguished Professor, anzi Sheldon Stone della Syracuse University, eh, che è venuto a parlarci dei tetraquark e pentaquark, di cui eh, i giornali eh, negli ultimi mesi hanno anche dato qualche annuncio. Eh, il professor Stone eh, si occupa di questi, della fisica dei quark da moltissimi anni, eh, ha lavorato all'esperimento Clio, eh, di cui è stato co-spokesperson, eh, eh, dove sono stati visti i quark B, e i mesoni di S e tante altre cose molto interessanti, è stato eh, proponente dell'esperimento BTEV e eh, successivamente è entrato in LHCB in cui lavora da diversi anni eh, anche con una parte molto attiva nella proposta di upgrade dell'esperimento. Adesso appunto fra le tante cose di cui si occupa perché non solo di eh, spettroscopia e, eh, ma eh, di tanti altri aspetti della fisica del flavor eh, ci sono anche queste eh, interessanti osservazioni di cui vi verrà a parlare. I'm sorry I spoke in Italian for uh, students, but I suppose you will have uh, understood everything. In any case, <laughs> it's your turn. Sounded good. <laughs> I would like to speak in Italian, but I don't speak Italian, so <laughs> this, would, uh, this is going to be in English. Okay, so uh, um, I want to tell you about some recent results we have on uh, pentaquark baryons and a, a few results on tetraquark mesons. So you <laughs> so you get a perspective on what's going on here. Um, please interrupt me if you have any questions, because otherwise I, you know, I might fall asleep up here. If you want to see that. Okay, so let me start out by uh, just indicating to you what, what the particles are and what they're made of. We have leptons, which are elementary uh, point considered to be elementary point particles and are fundamental constituents. We also have gauge bosons. And we have hadrons made of spin half quarks. Now, different quarks have different masses. Each one is a fundamental. Perhaps they have substructure. We've never seen it, but uh, maybe someday we will. Now, baryons normally are composed of three quarks. Quarks come in three colors. For baryons, each one uh, is a combination of red, blue, and yellow, which makes white if you're an artist, and that's colorless. So all hadrons are colorless. And mesons are normally composed of a quark and antiquark. So we have three possible combinations uh, for mesons. Now, one, one of the mysteries we have that we don't try to explain because uh, we, we actually haven't been able to is why the masses of these fundamental constituents are so different. So we have neutrinos whose masses we don't exactly know, but they're down here in the sub-EV region. And then we have the top quark, which is about 173 GeV. So there's 1,200 orders of magnitude difference between the uh, neutrinos, the leptons, and the quarks. And we actually have no idea why these, these particles have different masses, these fundamental constituents. And we take this as parameters of the standard model. You measure the masses, and, and, and that's, that's it. But it would be nice to have an explanation of this. I'm not going to give you one today, by the way. <laughs> now, the court model uh, was invented in 1964 by, independently by Mary Gelman and, 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 and George Why? Okay. But in their original papers, they both said that uh, baryons could be constructed with three quarks or four quarks and an antiquark, et cetera, while mesons could be QQ bar or QQ, Q bar, Q bar. Now, the uh, four quarks plus an antiquark later uh, became called pentaquarks, and the uh, two quarks and two antiquarks later became called tetraquarks, and that's an easy way to say it, so I'll say it that way, but it, it's not really five quarks, it's four quarks and an antiquark. Now let me tell you a little bit about the uh, LHCb detector. I won't go through in great detail. Well, this is a detector at the LHC. The protons collide here in the center of the vertex locator, and there are various components here. The riches are used for particle identification. 
These T stations, along with the vertex locator, are used to measure the momentum of tracks. And then there are, there's devices for measuring muons. So it's when a track penetrates through the, through the uh, iron. Now, this is a picture of the detector. Uh, you can't really see much. Here's the magnet. Here's a gas bottle, so you get an idea of the size. Uh, it's quite big. And here's a picture of the detector. This, uh, this is from the other side, so you can sort of see where the components are. Right. Now, the one of the most important measurements in LHCb is to find out where the vertices are of the PP collisions and any long-lived objects like B mesons or D mesons that come out and decay. So this, uh, this device for doing this is, is called a vertex locator, and it's made of silicon strips in a geometry where the, some of the strips go radially out and some of them go in a semicircular manner in, in, divided into segments here. So you can see a picture of the bottom half of this thing as it's been being installed, and then there's a top half that comes down. And there's a very thin 300 micron layer of aluminum here to separate the vacuum that this device is in from the beam vacuum. So the idea is to get as accurate as possible measurements of, the, of these uh, vertices. So here's a typical example of a vertex measurement. So in this case, we have a, a a B sub S, which goes out and decays into a kaon, and a D sub S, which then subsequently decays into three kaons. So this is an interesting mode for measuring CP violation in B sub S decays. Typically, we measure the primary vertex to about a 50 micron resolution, and the B sub S vertex to about 150 micron resolution. The B goes about one centimeter, which is quite a large distance, in fact. And then we translate this distance resolution into a time resolution using, using the uh, velocity. Uh, and we get about a 40 femtosecond time resolution on, on the B particles. This is generally true for, for most of the uh, final states. Now, this is 40 femtoseconds. So what does that mean? Well, the B lifetime is 1,500 femtoseconds. So this is actually quite good. And the experiment basically lives and dies on this. Okay, so this is the way of rejecting background. I'll show you an example of a real decay uh, later on in, in, in the talk. Uh, for example, the B factor is the time resolution was 900 femtoseconds. So that makes it, they have different strategies for reducing background, but the LACB strategy is to use this precision here. Okay, then we have a momentum and mass measurement so the particles go through, they hit these tracking stations here, and then they hit these other tracking stations, and they're bent by the magnet. And if you bend something with a magnet, you get its uh, momentum. You can see this magnet isn't small. These are not, you know, midgets. Uh, so it's a, it, and it's actually tapered. And these are pictures of the various devices. These are silicon strip devices during installation. So the mass resolution we actually achieve is about 15 MeV, which is, which is, which is quite good. And this mode, uh, I'll point out, is a Kobibo suppressed mode. The normal mode, the larger mode is D sub S pi, which has a 20 times higher rate. So you have to get rid of the D sub S pi, and this is the signal we're left with. We see a B sub S signal, we even see a B zero signal, and the residual backgrounds from other modes are, are quite small. They're, they're down here. So uh, essentially, this works very well. Okay. These devices are used, uh, they're Cherenkov counters, which means the velocity of the particle is determined by measuring the uh, light emitted from the particle as it goes through matter, because the speed of light uh, going through the matter of the particle is, gr is greater than uh, C. Well, not greater than C, but it's greater than what it's supposed to be. So here are the Cherenkov cones, and you measure the radius of the cone, and the radius of the cone tells you the velocity of the particle, and since you know the momentum, you can decide on the mass. Okay, we can skip this, skip this. Oh, well, this is important. This is how well we do in identification. So the probability of identifying a K on a K on is a function of its momentum, well, this is the efficiency, is about 97%, and the probability of getting a fake, that is a pi faking a K, is about 4%, and it changes with, 
this momentum. So the muons, you get a track that goes through here, it gets bent, and then it, it actually penetrates this iron, and there are devices there to uh, tell you that a particle was there. This is huge, this person down here. So you can see that these devices are, are quite large. It's not a small detector. What happened? Wow. I didn't do anything. This did it to me. Oh, I, I think, you know, there was a notice. I had to update some stuff. All right. Now, LACB, quite frankly, nobody thought about pentaquarks at any point until this analysis started. So what is it designed to do? It's designed to find or establish limits on physics beyond the standard model using CP violating and rare beauty and charm decays. So in rare decays, we've... Uh, published results on B sub S and B to mu mu, B zero to K star mu mu, B minus to K E E over K mu mu. We've measured CP violating angles, uh, which are named gamma, beta, phi S. Gamma was measured with best with B minus to Z zero, K minus to Ks. And phi sub S was measured with B S to J psi phi and J psi pi pi to Ks. In fact, all of the k's of b and bs to j psi pi pi and j psi kk were studied. So in completing this program of studying all these decays to see, uh, to, to make the phi s measurements and see if there were any other interesting uh, effects in these uh, hadron systems, we actually looked finally at b0 to j psi kk. Now, this turned out to be an exceedingly dull decay mode that no human being should be forced to investigate. There's essentially nothing there. But it, and it turned out, of course, whenever you do a paper in LHCV, there's a review committee. And even though you're bored with it, the review committee generally isn't. So they kept asking questions. And one of the questions was, gee, have you worried about lambda b to j psi kp being a background? Even though we have Trankoff identification, you could misidentify one of these, k, one of the proton as a kaon. If you misidentify the proton as a kaon, you, you, you can get a background here, and there's a lot of this rate, maybe, and, and very little of this rate. So the problem, we were presented with this problem, so we went and looked in the particle data book, and nobody had ever seen J psi, at lambda b to j psi k minus p. It was unknown. So the first response to the reviewer would have been, leave us alone. Nobody's ever seen this decay mode. But in thinking about it, we decided the reviewer would never accept that, and so... We told the gra I told the graduate student to go and look for the lambda b mode, and he had a very interesting response. He said, no, <laughs> it's a waste of time. I said, you know, it was a waste of time, but do it anyway. And after repeating that with some stronger language, he went out and did it. And the result was uh, quite interesting. First of all, here's a candidate for a lambda b to j psi k minus p. So, Here's the PP production point. You can see many tracks that define the production point. Then the lambda B comes out, and this one goes about two centimeters. And then at this point, it decays into four tracks, two of which are identified as muons because they make tracks through the muon detector. And this K and this proton are identified in the rich detectors. So it's, it's very clean, and everything comes from a single point here. So this decay resolution on this vertex is really very good. It's one of the best we can do in LHCb because you have four tracks and uh, they all form one point. So he went then, we looked at the distribution, he actually found 26,000 signal events with a 5.4% background. Uh, it turned out this had absolutely no effect on the mode we were studying, the B0 mode, because the background, there was very little background from this when you include the particle ID and, and where if you put a K on here, where, where it reflects to in mass. However, we immediately realized that uh, there was a long-term problem in the lambda B lifetime measurement. In lep times, they had measured the lifetime as 1.30 picoseconds, whereas the B0 picoseconds was, B0 lifetime was 1.5 picoseconds. And the original theory by uh, Yurelitslev, who unfortunately passed away, but was here actually, was that the lambda B lifetime should be within 2% of the B0 lifetime. So that we went out and we measured the lifetime. And in fact, Yurotsev was right. 
was, who was within 2% of the B0 lifetime. So we, th we felt very good that we had answered this controversy. But in looking at this, we looked at the substructure of this decay because to get the efficiencies right, you have to, you have to understand what the substructure is. So there's a thing called a Dalitz plot where you, if you have three-body decay and you take the mass of any two of these versus the mass of any two, the other two, well, actually, you use mass squared, then you can see the structure, the structure appears. It's very easy to see the structure. So if you look here in the mass square of the K minus P system, you see lots of activity, lots of vertical bands, and that's what we expected. But if you look in the J psi P mass, you see the horizontal band here. And this was not expected. To show you this uh, in more detail, Here's the projection, and this, term, this time in mass of Kp rather than mass squared. But you can see there's a lot of resonance structure here. Okay, so the, these are lambda star resonances which decay into Kp. This is phase space. It doesn't look anything like phase space. So this, this was fine. And you can write the Feynman diagram for the decay like here. Here's a lambda b. This is a typical decay on how you get a j psi. b decays to a c quark. The w decays into a, a c bar s. You get a J psi here, and you get an SUD, which could be a lambda or a lambda star, which then decays to K minus P. But now if you look at the projection in J psi P, your anxiety level goes up because there's sort of an arrow peak here, which would be something like a pentacork. So we actually didn't believe it. And the decay diagram for this would be something like this. You still get a W going to C bar uh, S, but you make a K on here, and then you make a, this, this four-quark plus anti-quark object here. So the question was, does this really exist, or we just have some artifacts? Now, this would be very interesting because this would be a new state of matter beyond the simple quark picture, and this could teach us a lot about quantum chromodynamics, which is not anything close to being fully understood. And there's no reason why they should not exist. They were predicted early on by Gelman and Zweig. And there were others later in specific QCD models, Jaffe, Hogason, and Sorber, Stratman. And we, you know, they would be short-lived, 10 to the minus 23 second resonance, is whose presence is detected by mass peaks and angular distribution showing the presence of unique spin parity quantum numbers. In other words, we don't want to only describe this by a bump in the mass peak. We want to describe all the decay amplitudes and all their interferences. And so we know what the spin parities of these, of these things are and the other components. But we were quite prejudiced against the pentacork interpretation. First of all, no convincing states had been seen 51 years after this proposal of Gelman and Zweig. And in fact, there was a very bad history in this topic, because previous observations of several pentacork states had been refuted. There was this famous theta plus, which decayed either into K0P or K plus N at a mass of 1.54 GeV with a width of 10 MeV. Uh, there were several experiments here that saw the peak, and then there were several really good experiments, including one which saw the peak, which then said it wasn't there. Then there were uh, resonances in D star minus P that was uh, seen in one higher experiment, but not the other. And there was even an observation at CERN of a doubly charged cascade, which was refuted again by other experiments. Now, they were found and debunked by looking for bumps in mass spectras. And this happened around 2004. And there's a nice review article by Hicks that describes all this. Hicks was on the experiment that first saw it and then didn't see it. Didn't see it. Okay, so the next question is, are there artifacts that can produce a peak? Okay, this is an experiment that has a detector. Detectors could have problems. Could, the, could there be a problem here? So one of the things we worried about was maybe if you misidentify a P to a K or a Pi to a K, you could get, you could be seeing a reflection of B sub S to J psi KK or B zero to J psi K Pi. And this is conspiring to make a peak. Well, we ended up doing uh, this in several ways, but one, the baseline way was to just take the lambda b to j psi pk, change the p to a k, and if we got a peak that was consistent with the b sub s spectrum, we threw it out, and similarly for b0. So we just vetoed those events. They were small, 
and we really didn't have to do this. Now, there's another effect, which are called clones and ghost tracks. So clones are that the track in the detector is a beautiful track. It's so nice that the tracking system makes more than one track out of it. So you can get two tracks when there's only one track there, and that could lead you to a problem if you in, use both tracks in, in your mass fit. But there's a lot of software to kill these, and you can actually measure, look at the difference in three momentum be, between all the tracks in K. And I think we found there was maybe one track out of 100,000 that, that could have been a clone. So that was not an issue. And ghost tracks is another problem where you find a track in the upstream system and a track in the downstream system, but they're not really the same track and you mismatch them. And there are ways of checking for that and there were really no ghosts left in the sample. We even checked cascade B decays decaying y of pi onto a lambda B where you then confuse the pi on from the cascade B as part of the lambda B decay and that wasn't a problem. So after worrying a lot about detector related effects, boy, I guess you're not allowed to talk too much here. <laughs> so the question is, can interferences between the lambda star resonances generate a peak in the J-SLI mass spectrum? So basically, our gut feeling was this was what was happening. But in order to prove this, we, we had to write a decay amplitude analysis. Well, we wrote one that incorporated both sequences, but we're only going to apply it first to the lambda stars. So let me tell you about both the K sequences and then show you what happens when we try it just with lambda stars. So here you have a lambda B going to a J side lambda star and a lambda star decaying to K minus P. So in the lab frame, the lambda B goes to the psi and the lambda star, and then the psi decays into two muons, so you have a decay plane defined. Okay. So the angle between here, this decay plane and this decay plane is called phi mu, and then you have the decay angle in the J psi rest frame of the direction of the mu minus, say, okay, with respect to the, the J psi. And then you have a, another decay plane defined by the lambda star and another decay angle. So you have five angles. So that's what we started with. We had to match all these angular distributions, and the angular distributions depend on the spin parity of, the, of what the resonance is here. Now, you can also have this decay chain here where the lambda B goes to a PC and a K, and the PC decays into J psi P, and you can define similar angles. But then you have to rewrite all these angles in terms of these angles, which is a problem that was actually solved a long time ago by Jakob and Wick. Although implementing it here took a few months. It's not a trivial process. Okay. So in the end, we use, five, we use the mass of the K minus P and five decay angles as fit parameters. And then we use for the lambda stars, uh, right figures, or, or in the case of the lambda 1405, a flatte function. Now, you have a problem, and that is, how do you know which lambda stars to use? So you, you rush over to the particle data book, and here's all the list of all the lambda stars that are seen, or in some cases might have been seen. And you don't know, really know which ones to use because even though they're, they're there or might be there, they don't have to appear in your decay. Furthermore, for each lambda star, there are different, there are different orbital angular momentum waves that can be present. So each of these is an amplitude. Okay. An amplitude is both a real and imaginary part. So if you put all these in, you get 146 free parameters in the fit, which is possible, there's a lot of data, but there's a lot of computing time that goes into it. And so we started trying to use subsets of these, and eventually we decided, well, let's just do it all. And the reason we can do that is we found a way of using multi-core computers that allowed us to do the fit in one day instead of 10 days. Originally it was 10, and, and then usually crash for some reason. So <laughs> this was a big breakthrough. Then we also found, we said, well, we can reduce the number of parameters here somewhat arbitrarily, throw out some of these that weren't, use angular momentum uh, barriers to reduce the number of L waves, and we use this reduce model just for systematic purposes. In the end, we did all the fits with both, and, this was, and we compared the differences. So first attempt was 
no PC states. So we use this extended model. We use all the amplitudes, okay, and the uh, black is the data and the red is the total fit. And these are the different states that are included, including some really small ones here. And you can see we have a very good fit of the MK pi spectrum. We also get a good fit of the uh, angular spectrum, not a great fit. But, but if you look at MJ psi p, which is not, in, not the fit parameter, you can see it doesn't, it doesn't describe the data at all. And we spent a lot of time putting states in and out and trying to get this peak. No matter what we did, we couldn't get the peak. It was just no way. So we bit our bullet, and we tried the extended model, but we included one pentaquark state with a bright Wigner shape with spin parity up to seven halves plus or minus. In other words, you put in one in for one half plus, you try to fit. You just so you, you, you know you have to do 14 fits. Okay, do 14 fits. Now the best fit had a spin parity of either five hosts. Well, there were two good fits, one with 5 halves plus, one with 5 halves minus. And this is the best fit, and you can see that this is not very satisfying. So this would be this pentacork, but it doesn't look very good. So what do you do? Well, we decided to try two states. And lo and behold, with two states, we could fit this peak. And here are the two pentacork states here. Well, we're not really sure. We know that. One of these is three halves and the other one is five halves, but we don't know which is which, and we don't know what, but we do know they're opposite parity. They have to be opposite parity. Okay. Now, here's a fit to the angular distributions, which are very important, and you can see that the angular distributions are fit very well. Of course, you know, the, and well, the different pentacorks are in here and all the lambda stars. It just combines everything. Now, we also look at this in k minus p mass slices. So the first mass slice here is actually below the boundary where you can expect pentaquarks. Let me show you that again here. So if you make a mass slice in kp, you're slicing here. So you have a slice here, a slice here, and a slice here. The first slice, here's where the pentaquarks are, was deliberately chosen to be in this region. It's a good way of checking the fit and making sure everything is okay. Back, okay. So here's the fit to the data, and you can see we had a good description of this data here, just in terms of the, uh, of the different uh, states without pentacorks. I mean, the pentacorks are in the fit, but they, none of them show up. Now we start going up in KP mass. You can sort of see a peak here and you can see a very small fit projection for the one PC state and another PC state. Then in the intermediate region, these are getting a little bit bigger. Here's the peak again. And in the large KP region, you can see the wide state here and the narrow state here. Now, you can say, look, your total fit, again, the black is the data and the red is the fit. The total fit describes the, to the data very well. But if you add this to this, it clearly exceeds this by a lot. So you can say, what's going on? Well, what's going on is that these pentacork states can interfere with each other. Similarly here, the sum of these two doesn't make this big peak here. That's because the interference here is positive and the interference is negative. So that was the dollars plot. So, what you can do is you can plot the decay angular distribution of the PC state, of both PC states. So these are the fit projection. So here is the narrow state, nice and symmetric as it should be. Here's the wide state, nice and symmetric as it should be. And then you can plot the sum of the two from the fit projection. And you can see that the sum, this, the sum of this and this here is lower than this by a lot. And here it's, it's the other way around. So in the large, MKP region, there's a substantial amount of negative interference, and in the positive region, there's a substantial amount of positive interference. And this only happens uh, with opposite parity states that you can get this, this asymmetry. Okay. So that establishes the fact that we have to have two pentacork states. One state will not explain this data. 
this interference plot is quite, quite in, important and wasn't included in the original paper, by the way, because we didn't think of doing it at that point. Now, the significances are, are, are quite large. The fit improves greatly for one PC. Uh, if you study statistics naively, the change in minus two log likelihood of the fit is equal to the uh, chi squared, well, the, the number of sigma squared. So naively, it's about 15 sigma, and adding the second state improves by 12 sigma, and adding the two together, you get about 19 sigma. But this is a little bit overestimates the significances. We don't trust this completely. So we did toy simulations where we, we, we decided what, on the basis of the statistics we had and the shapes we had, what the significances would be. And the first state was nine sigma, the lower mass state, and the second one was 12 sigma, including the systematic uncertainties, which are not in here, coming from the difference mostly between the extended and reduced model results. And of course, we have fit results. So we have the masses, the widths, and the fit fractions. Well, here's a boring table, but an important table of systematic uncertainties. And uh, so this is the mass of the lower state, the, the mass of the higher state, the width of the lower state, the width of the higher state, and also uncertainties on the fit fractions. And all kinds of things were put in. The biggest one is the difference between the extended versus the reduced model, which changes the width of the lowest mass state by 54 MeV. If we vary the masses and the widths of the lambda stars, it changes by a bit too. Uh, if we put in non-resonant components arbitrarily, that changes the width. I'll discuss that in a minute. Uh, different spin parities, with it, which ones you take, changes the width. And then there were things involving the angular momentum uh, waves and, and how, we, how we change those. So all in all, we have fairly generous uh, systematic errors that appeared in the uh, other transparency, especially on the wide state. It's about 86 MeV for the width, which was 200 MeV. But for the higher states, only 20 MeV. Okay, so let me talk about the cross checks. Uh, one was there were a lot of people in LHCB who wanted to make sure this peak was real, so they did the analysis themselves. There was at least three groups. We didn't, couldn't put that in the paper, but everybody saw the peak even with different selections. We internally, with the four people we had, two people wrote, wrote the fitters, you know, how you do the data fit. They wrote them independently. And uh, they used slightly different background subtraction methods, which turned out didn't matter. And then we finally checked the fitters on Monte Carlo. But we really relied on all the results were done both ways, every single fit. So that was, that was important. We also split the data between 2011 and 2012, magnet up and down, uh, anti-lambda B, lambda B, even low PT and high PT lambda B samples, and everything was quite consistent. We tried extended model fits without PC states, but added arbitrarily two high mass lambda star resonances, because the signal is so prominent, they're high mass. And uh, we let the mass and width of these things vary, and uh, we could not get a good fit with these. We also tried four non-resonant terms with spins up to three halves, and we couldn't get a good fit with that. Now, as another, another way of looking at the data, instead of fitting the PCs to bright Wigner's, you can, you can actually just take a mass interval in, around the mass peak. We went from minus gamma to plus gamma and measure the real part and imaginary part of the amplitude. And for the 4450, the data look like this. Of course, there are big error bars here still, but and a, and a bright Wigner looks like this. So here's the data starting from lower mass to higher mass, and here's what you expect the bright Wigner to be. So that that was pretty good. And the 4430, the phase change was was just as big, but uh, we would have been happier if these points were were further negative on the real part, but they're not, and that will take more statistics before that looks better. Hopefully. Okay, let me talk a little bit about models. All models must explain the spin parity of two states, not just one. They also should predict properties of other states, masses with spin parities. 
Now, there are many models. We can start with a tightly bound quarks a la Jaffe. Uh, this is picture, these are all quarks. If you don't know what this one is, you can ask me. But it signifies a red quark. Okay. I think you know what this one is. All right. So two colored diquarks plus an antiquark, a model with uh, Professor Miani at all, it's here. It says that these are tightly bound. Okay, you have a diquark which has a unique color. Uh, two of them, so the, each diquark has a unique color plus an antiquark that makes a color singlet. There's a model by Leadbed which is a color diquark by a color quark. Uh, there were some papers a long time ago about the bag model uh, and string models with Rossi and Veneziano, which are very important in, in uh, the progression of these models. Then there are molecular models generally with a pion exchange for binding. In fact, only with a pion exchange for binding up till now. These are based on a model by Tornquist in 1994. These models usually predict only one state, one half plus, which is not what we're seeing. But they could, they could also presumably have something like Rho exchange and get other spins. They haven't done that. Several authors consider a sigma C D star plus component. And uh, all of, really all of these are post-dictions. You know, they saw what we saw, and then they, they said, well, maybe, maybe these are molecules. They could be molecules. I don't know. Then there's a somewhat uh, evil description from the theoretical community uh, called rescattering. These are post-dictions. They construct a non-bright Wigner amplitude that must mimic the shape and phase variation of a bright Wigner. And they do that by having the lambda b going to something like x, y, z, which then the x, y rescatter into a j psi p, k minus, or including the z. And when the mass of the x, y is very similar to the mass of the pc, and they have three components, they say that, uh, that, that there's a rescattering off the cusp of this resonance. Now, these models have so far not predicted the size of the resonance scattering amplitude, and it's also difficult to predict two states. So this reminded me of something from 1964. Why not? It's possible for other, is it possible for other processes to mimic resonant effects? And the example that, that was uh, a nightmare of my childhood, which is called the deck effect, which uh, is a lesson in confusion. So, the experiment was pi plus p goes to pi plus rho p, rho going to pi pi, using a 3.65 pi plus beam in a bubble chamber. Okay. Gerson Goldhaber at all. So here's the Dallas plot. This is the rho pi mass squared, and this is the p pi mass squared. And this is a low mass region in p pi mass, which has a lot of resonant structure. Instead of lambda stars, they're, they're what we call n stars, or deltas. So they just cut this out and looked in this region and uh, forget the circles. And then if you look at the rho pi mass, there was a known A2 resonance and a peak at the A, what they called a possible A1 resonance right near the edge of the phase space, which is called threshold. BEV means GEV, by the way, for those of you who didn't follow the change in 1968 or whenever it was. <laughs> it's the same thing. Okay, so what is this peak? Well, is it a kinematical effect? Not a real resonance. A clear enhancement near threshold. But maybe it's not a real resonance. So the theorist, the first name Deck, suggested that the threshold enhancement can be due to off-shell pi p scattering. So here's the resonance model. Something is exchanged here between the pion and the proton, and the pion turns into an A1, which decays into a pi in a row. But in the Deck effect, there's a the, there's a virtual pion here that scatters off some, well, pomeron component here, but you, you produce a pion here and, and the rho here, and these combine to form the mass peak. So it's not a real resonant. And Deck even took the data from uh, Goldhaber et al. and plotted his fit on it. So you can see it could explain the peak. So what does one do? Well, you can look for the A1 then in different channel states, different charge states in different channels. So here's a, a neutral A1 in Kp, but as soon as this appeared, there were many more sophisticated theory papers that could explain it in terms of the deck effect. So there's a whole 
Now, this thing did not last for a short time. This controversy continued until the observation of the A1 in Tau to 3 pi nu decays in 1977. So 13 years of pain. This is a, an experiment from PEP. Uh, this is a little later in 1987. You can see the 3 pi mass in tau decay, and uh, it's pure A1. This, pure, this is exactly the same thing. This plotted a little differently because they have more data, but that's it. So a full decay amplitude analysis where they used, where they found the angular momentum waves might have proved the resonant nature of the A1 earlier, but people were not doing that then. It's important to see resonant states in several ways. There was never an unambiguous demonstration of deck effect. Here with a lepton, you can't possibly have rescattering of any kind. So this is beautiful, and it showed that it was a, the A1 was a real particle. Now, if I have uh, a little more time, I can tell you about a few other things. Uh, five minutes will get most of this. Okay, so there's a, there's, there's a story of this Z4430 tetrachord. So in B minus to psi prime pi minus K peak, there was a peak seen in the psi prime pi minus mass which is a charged charmonium state. So it, again, it has to be exotic. It, it can't be a QQ bar state. Now this was first seen by Bell with a mass of 4430, hence the name, and a width of 45 MeV, which is kind of narrow. This was challenged by Babar. They said that they, they, they could explain their data in terms of K-star states, and they saw nothing narrow. Bell then reanalyzed their data, actually this time, instead of just a mass peak, using a full amplitude fit, similar to the Pentacore fit I showed you. The mass was 4485 MeV and the width was 200 MeV. So Barbara wasn't wrong. There wasn't anything narrow here. Okay. But they did see something wide. Uh, they didn't really get enough data to do the spin assignment. The LHCB analyzed their data in this channel. This is the LHCB data. It's about 10 times as much data as Bell had and actually got results quite consistent with what Bell had in their reanalysis. So I could show you this data here. Uh, this is the Dallas plot again. This is m squared k pi, and you can see the resonances in the k pi system. It's this band that in the j psi, in the psi prime pi mass that's of interest. And if you do the projection here, you can see this is a log scale. So these are very huge peaks in k star. So you can look here in this region. The total fit going this way, this projection in psi prime pi mass squared, this is the total LHCB fit without a Z, and then this one is the one, the red bars with the Z. And, and uh, if you just look at this middle region, it's much more prominent. And LHCB also did the same thing. They have an argon plot, which looks, which looks quite good. But nevertheless, there were also attempts at rescattering explanations of this. So it just gives me a chance to show you some of the rescattering diagrams. Look at this one first. You have a B0, which decays into a D star and a DS, a special kind of DS. And then it exchanges a D0, and you get a psi prime, a, a psi prime or psi 2s pi k. And in here, it goes into a k and a D, okay, and, it, and a D0, and a rescatter, and, they, and you get this. So you have a DDK final state where these rescatter into this. Now, in this one paper, they use, they use this model, but the phase they get is opposite the phase of a bright Wigner. But other people have phases similar. Okay. Then there's one other result with a full amplitude analysis on B0 to J psi pi k, which I won't describe in detail. But Bell claims to see both the uh, 4430 in, in, in J psi pi with a branching ratio about a tenth as large as uh, in psi prime pi. And they also claim a new state at 4200 here with the full amplitude analysis. Uh, nobody's checked this. Forget this. They also produce an argon diagram that looks kind of reasonable for this 4200. But this needs confirmation for another experiment. Now, there are many other tetraquark states that have been seen without amplitude analyses. Uh, so we don't, there's some suspicion about these, but they're candidates. They all, for some reason, contain a CC bar or, in one case, a BB bar. 
So for some reason, these heavier quarks seem to seem to be uh, more more likely to be found in, uh, in in these exotic states. Now here's a slide uh, produced originally by Steve Olson for the tetraquarks only. So here are the established CC bar states in yellow. The predicted and undiscovered ones, you can see this one's hiding under here in gray. Neutral exotics, things people don't fully understand, although this one could very well be this predicted state here, shown in uh, this, uh, this color here, more of everything. And then in purple, there are the charge states, including the 4430, for which uh, some of these need amplitude analysis. So in conclusion, LHCB has found two resonances decaying into JSIP with a pentacore content of UUD, CC bar. They have spin 3 halves and 5S and opposite parity. Determination of their internal body, the color chemistry will require more study. Other exotic states have appeared containing CC bar or BB bar quarks. Uh, the 4430, for example, appears to be a tetraquark, uh, LHCB made a unique spin assignment of one plus. There's some question about why are we seeing these states and not ones with, with S quarks? Is the binding stronger for the CMB? Lattice QCD calculations providing masses would be most welcome, and we look forward to further searches for exotics. Thank you very much. So. Uh, does anybody have a question? It's not actually a question, it's a curiosity. I was really impressed by the number of free parameters in the fit. It's 150 almost, and you used for the systematics a reduced number of fits. Uh, when we did this similar analysis in the charm sector, one of the problems was the appearance of multiple minima due to the fact that, uh, especially for the phases, you don't know the value of the parameters as input to the fit. So you can end up with different uh, minima. And this was a big pro computation problem. How did you solve that? Well, it was a nightmare for about a week. <laughs> and then we, sort of, we, we, we started moving around the starting points and, and believe we found the real minima. They weren't too, we just investigated the phase space of all the minima, basically. And it wasn't too bad after we, but we, were, we realized there was a problem with that. Other questions, curiosities, doubts? <laughs> yeah, but suppose that you have, suppose that you have um, found the wrong minima and you make, let's say, a Monte Carlo running on different minima. How would that change the final result? Well, we didn't find the wrong minima. I know. <laughs> I know, but what happens if the minima are close enough and you may end up? Um, we we investigated minima. the, we spent a lot of time investigating where the minima were, were, and the other minimum were sufficiently far away from the real minimum that though we didn't think statistically there was any, any possibility. Yeah. And in, you know, in some cases, it doesn't, well, this wasn't a minimum question, but if you eliminate some of the way, some of the constants, it doesn't make much difference. That's basically the. Minus two log likelihood, yeah. Yes, it discriminates well. Just a comment and a question. I'd like to thank uh, Sheldon because uh, the discovery of Pentacore made for us a very exciting summer. I was with my wife in, uh, in Mexico and uh, Antonello Polosa was in San Francisco. So we had very small time difference and we could make up two papers together. But uh, what is amazing and what is very important is that two states with opposite parity. This is really exciting because uh, uh, this is what you would find in states which have uh, a internal quark substructure where you have uh, possible orbital angular momenta. And in fact, uh, in, the, in, the tetra, in the pentaquark picture, it's very natural that the lowest one 
is a positive parity. This is what you would expect. Uh, for, sorry, the opposite. There is negative parity. This is what you would expect because you have a, an anti-quark which has the opposite parity as the quarks, and the, the next one is positive parity, which is uh, what you expect for a, a L equal one excitation. Now, this is the, the, the comment. Uh, the question is, uh, uh, that you know very well is, uh, the is the following. You, you look at lambda B decay, and you have a K minus as a spectator, so to say. You have K minus and then something recoiling. And of course, what recoils is uh, uh, baryon number equal one. If you would look to uh, state with the, re with the antiproton, instead of K minus, what would recoil would be a baryon number equal two state. Now, baryon number equal two states made, uh, not, not the deuterium, but uh, made with, uh, with uh, diquarks have been predicted since a long time. We analyzed that and it will be very interesting to see whether you see something new things in the channel where you have a recoiling uh, antiproton. And uh, so this is the question. Do you see the dike work? <laughs> well, I can't tell you what we see or we don't see, but I can tell you that, that we're looking, I mean, one of the analysis we're doing is B0 to J psi PP bar. And we can look in that. But of course, you're limited in phase space. Okay. okay. So people are looking at various okay, things. Discuss that. Okay. Congratulations, it's a beautiful Thank experiment. You. And I was very happy for the Z4430 because when it came out the first, we said this is a, uh, this is a wonderful tetraquark which has to be paired with the X. However, there are about 500 MeV difference between the Z4430 mm -hmm. and the X. And we said, well, this will be the first radial excitation. And if you saw, that should be a Z at 3900, which was what was found three years later. Yes. Mm -hmm. In fact, two were found, exactly what expected. So it's, uh, I, I, of course, I don't believe in, uh, as you said, in deck effects or cusp, etc. All that seems to me uh, out of the point. What I believe we are seeing is a real new spectroscopy in which uh, Quarks are replaced by anti-diquarks, or anti-quark are replaced by diquarks. In this scheme, you should see the sequence would be baryons, tetraquarks, and then dibaryons. And yes. the, if you find that, we will be very happy. So will we. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Last. Last one uh, is a, in a question related to the efficiency treatment. We know that when you perform a Dalit plot analysis, one of the crucial issues is uh, the efficiency correction to your model, especially when you have uh, so many multi-body decays. So how did you uh, oh, cope well, with it? Of course we did that. I mean, uh, we, we basically generated a huge amount of Monte Carlo. <laughs> no, no, you, when you generate the Monte Carlo, you generate it flat in phase space. Okay, so, so you have the efficiency in each mass region of the Dallas plot, and then all the, all, well, we don't, the fit takes into account, has, it has the efficiency matrix. Well, actually, we parameterize the efficiency in terms of a function. So it takes into, it has a function that describes the efficiencies. It's in the paper, in the supplementary material <laughs> at the end. <laughs> Okay, I think uh, we can uh, thank once more uh, Professor Stone and end up uh, the seminar.